Okay, hi everybody. So this is um, a third video of lecturing uh, for History 602, the history of New England. Uh, in the first video I talked about English colonization coming to the Americas, and I concluded by mentioning that the way things happened um, in English colonization, you wound up with these joint stock corporations that were dominated, especially the New England ones, uh, by Puritans. And uh, then in the second one, I went to give some background on the history of Christianity, and that was really to set up what I'm going to talk about today, which is who are these Puritans and where do they come from. Um, <clears throat> I was saying last time that Christianity has this built-in split personality complex. Um, on the one hand, it tends to think of itself as a religion for the holy few, for the true believers, the outsiders, the minority, um, those who are willing to face persecution and so forth for their faith. And on the other hand, though, it's also a universalistic religion, which tries to make itself the religion for everybody, tries to reach out and incorporate whole societies um, into its uh, framework. And that <clears throat> in the history of Christianity, what you have is wave after wave of reform movements trying to settle this division, trying to find a balance between the two, waving back and forth, sorry, moving back and forth like a pendulum uh, between one and the other. One of the biggest uh, such reform movements in Europe uh, came along starting in 1517 in uh, mostly northern Europe to start with, and this was the Protestant Reformation. Um, over the course of the Middle Ages, between 500 and 1500 AD, uh, you'd had a medieval church emerge which had a couple of uh, major characteristics. One <coughs> was that it was very hierarchical, um, which is to say the church had a hierarchy. Over your ordinary believers, you had priests. Over the priests, you had bishops. Over bishops, you had the pope. Right? You had a real sort of a command structure or a uh, uh, structure of uh, jurisdictions uh, nested one over the other with the pope at the top of the whole system. And this was uh, very essential uh, to the way medieval society thought about Christianity. Medieval Christianity was actually very, very diverse, and lots of different things were going on in it. It was uh, not actually all that rigid of a structure, but wherever you went, the hierarchy was something that was a reality of church life, whatever sort of other variations were going on. So that was uh, one important dimension about medieval Christianity, the sense of hierarchy over the whole thing. Um, and the other dimension to it was that it was highly sacramental, uh, which is to say highly ritualistic. Uh, you had a series of sacraments or rituals which would follow a person through all the major developments in life. Uh, when you were born, you were baptized. Um, eventually you would be confirmed. Uh, when you came of age, you presumably got married, um, and marriage also uh, had become a sacrament in the medieval church. If you didn't get married, you might, might be because you went to the priesthood, and that meant you would get ordained um, on a regular basis, um, at least once a year by church law. Some people did it much more frequently. Um, you would have to perform the sacrament of confession and do penance uh, for your sins. Penance is something we don't have to worry about too much here. Um, and then as you uh, approached your death and were on your deathbed, you would have the last rites, um, which would be uh, sort of a final uh, combination of uh, penance and, uh, oh sorry, I missed one of the biggest ones, you had communion or the Eucharist, um, the sacrament in which Christians would regularly uh, partake of bread and wine, which were understood to be um, transubstantiated by a priest into the very body and blood of Jesus Christ himself. And then, as I was saying, uh, at the end of your life you would have one final communion and one final confession of your sins that composed the last rites uh, to prepare your soul to travel into the afterlife. So highly sacramental, right? All these rituals were really, for many people, the substance of Christianity, the substance of how they experienced religion was, particularly the priest, uh, was through the Christian hierarchy performing these sacraments, and these really had major pride of place. Um, what happened in the Reformation, <coughs> the Protestant Reformation, was a movement which wound up, <coughs> excuse me, uh, challenging some of these major features of medieval Christendom. Um, <coughs> the reformers came along, and initially what they were mostly concerned about, this is starting with Martin Luther in Germany, <coughs> they were concerned about abuses of the sacraments, particularly abuses of the penitential system. Um, and they were concerned about abuses of the hierarchy. Um, in the Protestants' view, what was going on was too much of members of the hier hierarchy exploiting their authority, exploiting their power, exploiting their ability to perform the sacraments in order to get rich and powerful at the expense of everybody else. Okay, um, So the uh, worst um, abuse which really keyed them off uh, was something called indulgences in which uh, people were basically selling pieces of paper um, that you could, uh, you know, these documents that you could get which would allow you to sort of skip your penances and that kind of a thing. Basically you're just 
blatant money-making uh, kind of schemes going on with these indulgences. But the debate pretty soon started going beyond indulgences, uh, started going to the issue of, well, does the hierarchy have the authority to do this kind of thing in the first place? And is the ritual system, the sacramental system, that the indulgences are based on, is that actually valid? And how do you figure that out? So the Protestant reformers started really questioning uh, both the foundations of the sacramental system and the justification for having a church hierarchy. Um, in order to do so, they turned to Christian Biblicism, something I mentioned is one of the major principles of Christianity, and they introduced a principle they called sola scriptura, which was to say, if you can't find it in the Bible, sola scriptura is Latin, it means only scripture, or by scripture alone. Uh, the idea of sola scriptura is that the Protestants were saying Christianity should be based only on the Bible, only on the Word of God. Things that human beings come up with over the course of time, um, processes that they work up, solutions to problems that they come up cannot carry similar authority to the authority of the Word of God that you find in Scripture. Right? So what the Protestants basically did was they took the Bible and set it over against history, over against tradition, over against the church hierarchy to say none of those things carries enough weight to outweigh the Bible. Okay? And I uh, would say, if you don't find it in the Bible, it doesn't carry authority. It is, at best, optional, and it might even be forbidden, okay? Even if the Bible doesn't explicitly condemn it. Sola Scriptura, we're all going to try and rebuild Christianity, re-reform um, Christianity, that's why we call it a Reformation, reform Christianity into something that looks more like what the Bible alone says it ought to look like, okay? Um, now, among these uh, Protestants, uh, you get varying degrees of um, compromise or varying degrees of radicals in terms of how far they are willing to go. On the one hand, you have some comp uh, sorry, some Protestant uh, reformers who are moderates, who are willing to compromise, who are willing to say, yes, we want a principle of sola scriptura, but if the Bible doesn't explicitly condemn something and it seems to be useful, then we can still do it. Um, so, for example, the Bible doesn't say, thou shalt not have bishops, uh, bishops being, you know, important members of the hierarchy. So you'll have some of the more conservative, moderate reformers, like the Lutherans, uh, like the uh, Anglicans, and we'll get more to them in a bit in England, um, who will continue to have bishops and priests in their churches. Uh, they're pretty sure they don't want a pope, uh, so you don't get a pope continuing. Uh, but you will have them saying, we can still have priests, we can still have bishops, we can still keep the institutions and the hierarchy intact, even as we're reforming various other things. Uh, that are going on. Um, so that's one sort of conservative moderate end. On the other hand, you have a more radical end, uh, more extreme reformers, uh, particularly uh, guys like Ulrich Zwingli and John Calvin down in Switzerland, who are saying, no, that's not good enough. If you really want to have a reformation, sola scriptura doesn't just mean um, you can allow things that are not explicitly condemned by the Bible. Rather, the church's authority comes only from the Bible. And so if the Bible doesn't positively instruct you to do something, you can't do it. You know, not as part of the church. There's still lots of things that happen in life, because the Bible doesn't talk about everything in life. But the church cannot do anything, cannot establish any kind of an office or any kind of a ritual or teach any kind of a doctrine unless you can say this is in the Bible. Okay, so only the Bible is going to give you things you do in church. You're going to eliminate everything else. So these more radical uh, reformers, um, often kind of just called the reformed branch of Christianity, it's what they call themselves, others usually call them Calvinists, they will say, no, no priests, no bishops, we don't see them in the Bible, we're not going to have them, and many other things. So much more thoroughgoing, uh, clean sweep through everything in religion to try and come up with something much more stripped down, much more minimalistic, uh, focusing much more on what they see in the Bible. Okay. Um, another thing, by the way, which is, oh, well, actually, let me hold off on that for a moment, uh, you can get more radical still. Um, the uh, Reformed churches, or the Calvinist churches, will still believe in this basic notion that Christianity is for everybody, that you ought to have whole communities of believers, and therefore that the church still has authority over pretty much everybody in society uh, without exceptions. Uh, you will get some more radicals who we group together often under the word Anabaptist, although that doesn't always apply to all of them, and they weren't all actually connected with each other. But the radical reformers, generally the Anabaptist reformers, who challenged that idea? When they applied the principle of sola scriptura, they looked at the church in the New Testament and they said, well, this was not a church that encompassed everybody, right? The Christians back in New Testament times were a tiny minority 
in a much bigger sea of unbelievers. Why should we expect things to be any different in our time? And they were really wanting to go back to the days of the martyrs, the days of the early church, and say, no, no, Christianity is really just a matter for a chosen few, for the true believers, and the rest of the society can do what it wants, but even if it's pretending to be Christian, Christian it isn't really. Okay, so these radical reformers separating themselves off from society, um, separating themselves off, you know, refusing to have any kind of a, a vision of a Christian society with church having authority over everyone, and uh, much more separating themselves out of that kind of a way. And hopefully, um, when you're reading the Roger Williams book, you'll pick up on some of the uh, similarities between these kinds of radical ideas and Roger Williams's ideas. Okay, <coughs> so sort of three branches, you get the sort of more moderates who are keeping bishops in hierarchy and sacraments to some extent, though they're reforming them. You get the Calvinists who are trying to more make a clean sweep and have everything be according to the Bible the way they see it, but they're still thinking in terms of a Christian society. And then the radical reformers who are really trying to break away from the whole idea of a Christian society and have uh, Christianity be a matter for a sort of holy minority again. Okay, so that's the outline of the Protestant Reformation. Obviously, the Protestants don't take over all of Europe. Large areas continue to remain Catholic and are loyal to the Pope. We call them the Roman Catholic after the Reformation as opposed to medieval Catholic because after the Protestant Reformation the um, uh, litmus test for whether you're Catholic or not in these countries is whether or not you're loyal to the Pope at Rome, right? It becomes much more central than it had been in medieval times and so Roman Catholicism as opposed to simply medieval Catholicism on the one hand. So places like Spain, France, Italy remaining largely Catholic, southern Germany, Austria, places like that. Northern Europe, northern Germany, Scandinavia, Scotland, um, all becoming, uh, tending to go in the Protestant, or uh, Switzerland also going in the Protestant kind of direction. That brings us to England, okay, which is uh, going to get us to our Puritans here. In England, uh, King Henry VIII had initially been a strong supporter and defender of traditional Catholicism, um, but then he needed a divorce and the Pope was not willing to grant him one, and so Henry VIII decided to break with Rome and declare the Church of England to be under his authority as king rather than under the Pope. The king made himself head of the church. Now, Henry was otherwise pretty conservative. This was the guy who had been persecuting Protestants and been um, uh, criticizing Protestant ideas uh, for, a while, for a good decade uh, before he made this switch. Uh, so he wanted to keep the Church of England as conservative, as traditional as possible. Okay, in our Protestant uh, spectrum, from the most radical to the rather, you know, to the Calvinists, to the more uh, moderate uh, conservative ones, Henry VIII was definitely at the conservative end. He liked ritual, he liked sacraments, he liked bishops. He wanted to keep everything pretty much as it had been. He shut down the monasteries and he made himself head of the church rather than the pope. Apart from that, he wanted things to be pretty similar. The problem was that once he had broken with Rome, um, the hardcore Catholics in the country were unwilling to go along with him. They would go into exile or protest or even lead rebellions and things against Henry's rule. So Henry found that he couldn't really find enough hierarchically minded, sacramentally minded, conservative minded people to run the Church of England for him. He had to start recruiting Protestants just to sort of keep ministers in the churches and you know to recruit his bishops and so forth. And so he had a lot of Protestants rising to positions of power and of course they wanted something that looked more like either the Lutheran churches in Scandinavia or better yet you had a lot of them that was, wanted something like the Calvinist churches down in Switzerland uh, rather than this more conservative kind of thing that the king wanted. Um, after Henry died his son Edward VI, a uh, rather sickly teenager, ruled for a few years and you had just a whole bunch of very hardcore Calvinists um, advising Edward VI and really trying to push the English church in that direction. Edward VI, though, was not very healthy, died after a few years. Um, his, uh, what was he, sort of half-sister, I guess, uh, Mary, who was uh, married to a French prince and was, um, I'm sorry, Spanish prince, and was a hardcore Catholic herself, she came in for four years and started trying to return the country to Catholicism, uh, persecuted a bunch of Protestants, burned people at the stake and stuff. She didn't last all that long, though, and in 1558, Elizabeth came in, became the new queen, and restored England to Protestantism. Um, Elizabeth basically tried to go back to Henry VIII's policies. She wanted a conservative, traditional kind of English church. One of the major reasons being that it's easier to control the church if you've got bishops, a hierarchy of bishops, at the top of the church as compared to if you don't have the bishops, right? The more radical kind of reformers, you get each individual church kind of doing its own thing to some extent, and it's harder for the uh, monarch to maintain control of religion, and so Elizabeth wanted a hierarchy, she wanted bishops, she wanted a church that she could control. Um, she also wanted to try and bring 
create a compromise because there's still a bunch of Catholics around and you've got Protestants around and she wanted to try and create a church that everybody could be happy with. Um, and she pretty much managed to hammer such a thing out. We call it the Elizabethan settlement. Uh, you wound up with an English church or an Anglican church uh, with bishops in place, what we call an Episcopalian system. I mean, Episcopalian means based on bishops, um, which has something resembling the old style rituals, although kind of reformed too. Um, has a set of doctrines called the 39 Articles, which are generally Protestant in character, but are worded in a way that you can interpret them different ways and you know, have more conservative interpretations placed on not a very radical statement of faith uh, coming out in the, uh, in the 39 Articles. So Elizabeth sort of tries to set this middle ground and create some sort of a relatively conservative type of Protestant church. The Puritans are the people who are coming out of Edward VI reign, right? decade or two earlier, um, who really wanted the Church of England to become a hardcore Calvinist style of church. They're basically, when they look at the Elizabethan settlement, they say, this doesn't go far enough. This is selling out. This is not what the Bible calls for. This is not the kind of religion we want to have. We want to have something that looks more like what Calvin's been doing down in Switzerland. Okay, um, So you get these people coming in and you know seeking church positions and often getting them. Um, and uh, preaching in pulpits or sometimes getting private lectureships where they would uh, preach to people um, on the basis of sort of private establishment rather than as official church pastors. You get this Puritan movement, right? This sort of movement saying we've started a reformation in England, but it's still not done. We're still not pure enough. We're still not reformed enough. We need to carry the ball across the, uh, across the touchdown line and actually score here and get a, uh, you know, get a proper reformation completed in England. This is going to set off a lot of controversy. Um, the Puritans have a lot of appeal in the middle class. In the literate merchant classes, they have a lot of appeal, especially in the cities. Um, the reason being, um, first of all, that they preach that uh, the church should not be run by bishops, who are mostly going to get recruited out of the nobility. They argue that churches ought to be more self-governing. Uh, you've got a couple different kinds of Puritans. You've got Presbyterians, who think that the church ought to be governed by sort of a councils of elders, basically, and you've got Congregationalists who argue that the congregation in the pews ought to be the ones sort of in charge of the church and they can sort of hire ministers to themselves as they see fit. So if you're noble or if you're, you know, the queen, you want bishops because you want to be, you know, have a group of people that has control of the church, but if you're a merchant in the city and you want to have control over your own church, you want to be a Congregationalist, you want to be a Presbyterian, something like that, so you can have churches that are more answerable to you and what you want out of religion and not what the nobles or what the queen wants, right? So they have a lot of appeal. The other reason why they have this appeal um, in sort of the middle classes, the merchant classes, is that the Puritans are really focused on Bible study. Right, remember sola scriptura, the Bible alone. This is where you get real religion from. So they study the Bible and to be able to read the Bible properly, they learn Greek and they learn Hebrew. They're very educated, they're very literate. Um, for the sort of, you know, farmers out in the fields, that doesn't necessarily mean all that much. But again, the merchants in the cities, they are educating themselves. They are developing literacy. They are very interested in being on top of learning and on top of education and on top of the new ideas uh, that are circulating around. They want to be preached to. You know, it seems kind of strange to us. We think of a sermon as a great snooze fest. But in a world without TV, without movies, um, without the radio or anything like that. Um, public speaking was a major way to get news and was a major way to even sort of get entertained in a sense. I mean, that's where you'll really hear a great uh, preacher come out there and, you know, wor work up the fireworks. This was great entertainment for people as well. And so they wanted preaching. Um, the nobles in the hierarchy who want to sort of say, no, 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 we've got our bishops and we're going to perform our sacraments and focus on that, they're not really all that interested in the preaching not really all that interested in the education and the learning to distinguish themselves. They're more interested in using the rituals and the ranking system to do that. Uh, but the middle classes, they like having educated preachers who focus on preaching, not guys who are going to go around doing mumbo jumbo and a bunch of rituals. Really, that's the way they see it. Um, so they really sort of pour their interest and their money um, into the Puritans. So you wind up with a religious struggle in England as you're getting into the 1580s, 1590s, early 1600s. Um, which is starting to turn into a class struggle and is starting to turn into a political struggle. Uh, these cities are putting people in Parliament now, right? You're starting to get a Parliament in England which has more and more Puritans in it because it's more and more representing the cities, the urban population, the merchant middle classes. 
um, and that's sort of over against the lords, the House of Lords, the Queen, uh, eventually the King. Queen Elizabeth dies in 1603, gets succeeded by King James, um, and you start getting uh, this uh, increasing tension over sort of a Calvinist Puritan group of people in the middle classes and then the sort of royalty and uh, nobility uh, and the sort of peasants or uh, farmers in the fields who are not necessarily so literate um, and are more um, impressed by the rituals than they are by a bunch of books. Um, and these are uh, sort of, uh, you know, how the battle lines are getting drawn. Ultimately in 1639 this is going to turn into a civil war and uh, going to lead uh, King Charles I to get his head cut off by victorious Puritan Parliament in 1649. Okay, we don't need to worry about that too much. You can pick up on some of that from the Roger Williams book. Um, finally, uh, what do these Puritans believe? Because this is another thing to understanding the culture uh, of uh, Puritan uh, New England uh, to a great degree. We've already sort of talked about um, they believe in a, a way of organizing churches, a church polity that focuses on the congregations ruling themselves, either on a kind of democratic congregationalist model or on a kind of a um, could have called it kind of republic oriented, I suppose, sort of a Presbyterian model ruled by these uh, representative councils. Um, so that's one important dimension. They don't believe in a hierarchy. They don't believe in bishops. Uh, they do believe that the word, that preaching, that uh, the Bible is absolutely essential, uh, rather than putting so much focus on rituals. Um, there's a couple of other distinctive um, ideas that are important to understanding the Puritans. Um, and there's two major ones. One of them is predestination. Okay. Uh, predestination is a doctrine that uh, John Calvin had seen in the Bible and argued ought to be taught more, and uh, the Puritans very much pick up on this, and it becomes very central to their theology and to their spirituality. Uh, predestination means that if you ask the question, why does one person become a Christian and get to go to heaven and somebody else doesn't, right? What's the difference between them? Uh, predestination says it's not because of the people, it's because at the beginning of the universe, before the beginning of time, God already chose some people who he was going to save and bring to heaven and other people that he was not. Okay? God predestines what a person's ultimate outcome is going to be. And so it's not the result of human action. It's not the result of human choices or human will. It's not a matter of people being good and doing good deeds and earning their way into heaven. It's simply because God chose some people and didn't choose others. Okay, so it's this very, very strong focus on the sovereignty of God as the one who chooses who's going to go to heaven and who doesn't, and it's not up to human beings. Uh, however, in predestinarian doctrine, uh, the Calvinists and Puritans would also say, the thing is that only God knows who is who. Right? We don't know who the people are who are the elect, the chosen ones, and who the people are who are the reprobate. Right? Somebody could be god-awful, alcoholic, womanizer, abuser, violent, whatever, and then God could, at God's chosen moment, convert that person, change their life, and transform them into somebody else. Um, and you have lots of people, uh, Isaac Newton in the 1700s, uh, very much he was a slave trader and stuff like that a horrible uh, kind of life, and then he uh, had a conversion experience and left all that behind, you know, classic sort of a thing. So however sinful and reprobate a person looks on the outside, you don't know they might still be one of the elect and God is somehow going to change them at some point in their life. Likewise, uh, a person could be a hypocrite, right? A person could outwardly look like they've got faith. Uh, they could look like they're doing all these great things. They could look like a great religious person. They may even have deceived themselves into thinking that they are, but really down underneath they're being hypocritical about it. Down underneath they don't really have faith. Down underneath God has not really chosen them, and you may not know that until the last judgment. Okay, so predestination on the one hand, um, whether you are chosen or not is by God, um, but is known only to God. We don't know as we go around society which is which. Uh, what that means for Puritan spirituality is they tend to put a lot of focus on the signs of salvation. Okay, you may never know for sure, but you can examine yourself and look for clues and bits of evidence that might tell you maybe you're one of the chosen or maybe you're not. Okay, so if you are very worried about the state of your soul, if you love going to church, if you love hearing sermons, if you find yourself feeling great comfort and satisfaction when you pray, um, if you feel deeply grieved whenever you commit even the slightest little sin, those are all good signs, right? Those are signs that probably you are one of the elect because a reprobate person probably wouldn't feel that way or you know wouldn't you know, be so eager to go hear a sermon or something. Um, 
Whereas if you're kind of reluctant and don't really like going to church and would rather be, you know, someplace else, um, so, you know, if you find yourself drawn to you want to go gambling or drinking or something like that, um, then it's probably a sign that maybe, you know, you're not really one of the elect. Um, so, and of course, all this naturally spills over into the ruling councils of churches, the elders and so forth, um, tending to scrutinize people around them and say, you know, you're in, you're not, um, you know, you're showing the signs of salvation and you're not. Um, but it also leads to a very personal, individual introspection. Uh, it's a major cultural shift in the development of Western civilization on whole. The rise of this kind of introspection that people have, looking inside themselves and trying to figure out, am I really a believer or not? You know, uh, sort of in some ways it's the origins of modern psychology, uh, the sort of inward looking spirituality, trying to figure out, am I predestined or aren't I? You know, can I find the evidence? Uh, one way or the other. So this very personal, individual, introspective character, um, which comes out of uh, the doctrine of predestination. Very, very important to periods. Um, the other thing, and this is where we're going to wind up, sorry, this has run longer than I intended to, but these are important ideas, and I hope you're finding them interesting. Um, the other important Puritan idea, alongside this very private, individual dimension, you also get a very public dimension, which is the Puritans believe in an idea called a covenant. Okay, and covenant, this goes back to um, the Hebrew scriptures, what Christians call the Old Testament um, as well, uh, they believe that God makes covenants with people. And they believe that um, when God makes a covenant, he doesn't just make it with an individual, he makes covenants with groups. What's a covenant? A covenant is basically a contract. Um, but it's a contract which is not negotiated out between equals. It's a contract which a superior partner hands down to a lesser partner to either accept or not. In other words, the superior says, these are going to be the terms of our relationship, okay? And you can either accept it or not, and if you don't accept it, then you don't have a good relationship with me, okay? They believe that God makes covenants with people, that throughout the Bible you see God coming to prophets or coming to patriarchs or kings or others and saying, here is the covenant, okay? This is how things are going to work. Um, when there's a covenant in the Old Testament, um, you have usually um, sort of a... Uh, history of the relationship, you know, what I have done for you, um, what God has done for you that, uh, you know, makes him God and makes him your God and means you want to be a part of this covenant. Uh, you also then will have uh, stipulations, a set of rules. Uh, here's, you know, here are, the, here are the ground rules, here are the conditions, here are the things you need to do, which is where morality and divine law comes from in Christianity. And then you have uh, promises of benefits that you're going to receive if you keep the rules and a threat of curses that are going to fall on your head and ways you're going to get punished if you don't. Okay, this is sort of the structure of a covenant. So establishing why the superior is the superior, laying out the ground rules for how the relationship is going to work, promising blessings and benefits if you keep the covenant, and promising you know, punishments and curses if you don't. Okay, so for Puritans, this is a very, very important idea. And again, the key thing is that God doesn't just make covenants with individuals. They believe God makes covenants with groups. Any social grouping of people can be under a covenant. Okay? A family can be under a covenant. A church, a town, a kingdom. Right? The, ultimately, the entire human race is under a kind of a covenant with God. That's the whole idea of Christianity and God's universal um, gospel in the world is a sort of covenant with humanity. But even the kingdom can be under a covenant. The church or the town can be under the covenant. Individual households can be uh, seen as being under covenants. Um, so God makes the covenant with a group, and therefore the whole group, by members of the group, simply because they belong to the group, because they belong to the kingdom or belong to the church or belong to the family, they are all bound to keep that covenant, Okay, regardless of where they're at individually or what they think individually. The covenant is still binding on everybody who's a member of the group. Okay, Very, very key idea. Um, the other thing about the Puritan theology of covenants is that you have <coughs> um, a representative head of the covenant community, okay, who is answerable to God for how the community is doing keeping the covenant and therefore has authority over the community to make sure that everybody is doing what they ought to be doing. Okay? So if you're looking at a family, the father, the head of the household, is responsible for his family's covenant with God to make sure his wife and his children and any servants in the household are all behaving themselves and believing and uh, following the covenant. Uh, the pastor of a church or the elders of a church likewise have a responsibility over all the church members to discipline them and train them and teach them and pre preach to them and make sure that they're all uh, living as they ought to according to the covenant. Uh, the king 
um, is answerable to God for making sure his kingdom is all behaved like a bunch of covenant people. See, so all these different communities all have these covenants are all working this way. Um, this shapes a lot of Puritan political thought, okay? Um, because it means that you're going to have very strong authorities at whatever level, including the colonial authorities in Massachusetts, uh, success centered at Boston, or what have you, or church pastors within their churches, or the way they think about the king, they're always asking the question, what is this leader's responsibility to God under the covenant? How well are they fulfilling it? And what kinds of authority do they have to enforce the covenant over the people who have been placed onto them? Okay, so very, very key sort of contractual understanding that they have over um, how society works at any level from the family right up to the kingdom um, in this sense. And this is going to affect, by the way, why Puritans are willing to enter into the Civil War. Ordinarily, Christianity in general, including Calvinism, teaches uh, that you ought to submit to ruling authorities. The Puritans see a way, um, see an, another dimension on this, where they argue that if the king is not fulfilling his covenant responsibilities to God, if the king is moving, you know, refusing to introduce to religion, or is starting to slide over towards false religion, or is tolerating sin and immorality in his kingdom, this kind of a thing, then the king is going to bring calamity and curses down on the entire kingdom, and it's the responsibility of uh, the other smaller covenant communities under him to correct him, and if you won't listen to correction, to ultimately overthrow him and replace him with somebody different, which is how you end up with an English Civil War. So covenant theology on the one hand, you see, notice there's a double-edged sword here, can work in two different directions. On the one hand, covenant theology can mean submit to the authorities, right? God has put them in a covenant over you. You need to listen to them, you need to obey them. Um, you know, you very, very strong sense of hierarchy in some senses where the pastors of the church, the fathers in their household, the governors of the colonies, the king over the kingdom has a very strong authority. But it also opens a back door to people saying, well, I don't think that this particular leader is actually fulfilling the terms of the covenant, is actually bringing in true religion, is actually doing God's will, and therefore I am entitled to resist them, oppose them, perhaps even overthrow them. Okay, and you can, as you look at the Roger Williams book, again, look for some of those dynamics. Okay, so that's a quick look, uh, not too quick now, sorry, but half an hour, um, dealing with the Protestant Reformation and the rise of Puritanism. Uh, so remember the principles of sola scriptura, this opposition in Protestantism to hierarchy and to sacrament, the sense of a ranking system in the church and to rituals, and Puritanism being um, this movement which really is trying to purify the English church in the midst of its compromises and struggles, and has these distinctive features on the one hand, this very inward-looking introspection spirituality that derives from its belief in predestination, and on the other hand, also uh, this very public sense of covenant which tends both to reinforce but then also in some ways to undermine authority figures in the community. Okay, and I'll stop there. Thank you very much.